Welcome to Kites and Strings, the podcast about creativity. My name is Steve Plume. My co-host, Catherine Shinnock, and I are both registered art therapists and licensed clinical professional counselors, in addition to being creatives. In this podcast, we explore creativity, and we especially look at the tension that is often present for those who choose a creative lifestyle. Along the way, we interview fabulous guests who have found their own successes living their creative lives. Today, we talk with Corey Graham, artist, designer, hillbilly. He's an artist from Appalachia, and he's not just creating quaint, crafty pieces carved from sticks and stones gathered from around his countryside. Those pieces are beautiful, and they are made by beautiful people, but Corey's work is different, unexpected. It's largely digital, it's often funny, politically charged, it's sometimes in your face, and it's very much avant Appalachian. But you will soon find that Corey is much more than an artist pushing the proverbial envelope. He's a true advocate and voice for those around him, and it is with these traits that he shoulders the responsibility of grabbing that string and flying that kite with his feet firmly planted in his beloved Appalachian community. There's a little background noise in Corey's audio, but it's mostly his son, which is way cute. And this is what podcasting remotely sounds like. Yeah, there's people out there that just make. And the idea that they can, that there's a market, so to speak, for that is something that they probably happen across. And Well, and the hardest part about that market that you're, you're speaking of is accessibility. Mm-hmm. Living here is not like living in New York City or Chicago or Los Angeles where there is an art scene. There is a, right. a gallery on every block. Mm-hmm. Here, it, you, you have to really work a hundred times harder. Yeah, I get that. I, I One of the artists we had spoken to, Dome Moon. Yeah. And she's she sells all of her stuff on Etsy. She kind of went the gallery route for a while, but she lives in the middle of the mountains. And yeah. the idea of getting in a car and driving, you know, or sh- packing things up and shipping it, um, it was just so much easier for her to do it online. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm about 45 minutes from Lexington. Okay. And, okay. you know, and Lexington is still a small town. I mean, 300,000 people, you know, it's not a huge metropolitan area, but uh, I mean, if you're, if you're looking to find yourself in any sort of a gallery situation or any kind of uh, where people are really looking mm-hmm. at your work, yeah. that's mm-hmm. the closest option you have. And I'm fortunate to be that close. So you get further yeah. into the hills and you are a two or three hour drive from anything. Right. Right. It's hard. It's probably great being in those environments and those settings. It's probably beautiful and it's inspiring. But sure. then what to do with those inspirations, the product of that inspiration later is, is the, the difficult piece, it's especially if somebody's trying to make some money off of it and try to sustain, you know, their, their habit, if you will. <laughs> you know, so. Right. Exactly. We, we take for granted sometimes that we know that there's a market out there and there's probably people out there that just make. Sure. And I, you know, I'm surrounded by those people all the time. Yeah. You know, people who would, if you ask them if they were an artist, they would never say yes, you know, never even mm-hmm. consider themselves an artist, but they make these incredibly beautiful things, whether it's wood crafting, uh, you know, we're, we're right in the middle of the Daniel Boone national forest. So we have a lot of hikers and campers that come through here. Okay. Okay. So, you know, we'll have people who make these exquisite, you know, walking sticks, hiking sticks made completely by hand, but they don't consider themselves artists. They just, you know, they, right. them tell it, I just make sticks to sell to tourists, you know? <laughs> right, right. That's so interesting. Great. Great. Um, yeah. That, that's, that's that idea of like, what do we, who would call them an artist? How many people don't, they'll say, I'm not creative or I'm not this, but like you said, there's people out there that are probably doing incredible work. Sure. Absolutely. That's so cool. A friend of mine's father used to own a junkyard and he would collect sandstone that looked vaguely like creatures and then kind Uh of sand it down into bears and squirrels and things. But he just did it because he thought it was cool. Uh It never occurred to him that that was art or that anyone would want it. He just thought it was neat to have a sandstone squirrel in the yard. They're just, they're just making stell to tourists. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But it never occurred to them that that was art. It's just a functional thing they sell to the people from Cincinnati who come down here and get lost in the woods. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I love it. 
We're going to stray for a minute from art and creativity, which is all good and will provide a backbone for the appreciation and passion we hear from Corey throughout today's discussion. So hold tight, I think you're going to learn something, and maybe you'll develop some appreciation too. So Corey, you said you're you're in Kentucky now. Yes. Is that now where have you where did you hail from? I'm originally from Charleston, West Virginia. Okay. okay. So even further into the hills than I am now. Okay. Uh, my uh, both of my grandfathers were coal miners, and uh, you know they came up in that real old school coal miner kind of thing. Uh, you know they lived in the company house. Uh, they were paid in script that was only used at the company store. I mean. Wow. It was really hard coming up. Wait, so there was its own whole like currency. Yes. If you worked for the mines, they paid you in these little metal tokens called script. And they were only redeemable at the company store. So they owned you essentially. Yeah. You, 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 the money that you were paid for your labor just went back to the coal company in inflated prices at goods that they would sell you for right. you to survive on. Because essentially they were the only game in town, right? They right. were there. They basically, they probably owned the housing. And, and if you, if you, they owned the land, they owned the housing, they owned the, the mines, the mineral rights, the store, the school, right. the, the recreational activities. And, you know, you were in, essentially you were an indentured servant. I mean, you, yeah. you went to work there and that was your life. Right. Right. And I think that that's one thing that a lot of times gets lost on people when you see these like, passionate defenses of coal mining and that mm -hmm. kind of ideology in, in Eastern Kentucky, Southern West Virginia and places like that is that it's such an embedded part of culture. It's more than dragging rocks out of the ground. It's more than being fossil fuel dependent, you know, for three, four generations, five generations in some case, this is, this is who we are. Mm -hmm. And as that whittles down, it's not that we don't care about the environment. In fact, most of the people around here are better stewards of the environment than anyone you could imagine. Mm. Yeah. So much has been taken away from people in the Appalachian region of America that it's just yet another thing that's being taken away. You know, and now it's yeah. like, it's almost like your identity is being erased. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, to hear that, like, it was everything. It was everything. Yeah. And so to not have that anymore, then it's like redefining. Right. And everybody seems to have a plan that we need to redefine it, but nobody seems to have a plan of what that's going to be. Right. 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 I, I mean, there's that whole idea of somebody said, okay, yeah, we're going to put a solar factory, solar panel factory here or a wind turbine factory here. Everybody can go and work there, but it doesn't just happen that way. Like you said, there's this culture that's been established mm -hmm. in that it's, it, it's more than just that, single job it's it's so many facets of one's life right is is what i'm hearing it is and it's a generational phase that's going to have to happen folks out here will vote against their own self-interest left and right if it means preserving mm -hmm. what they consider to be the last remnants of their culture years ago i worked for a um nonprofit organization that was responsible for relocating people from housing projects in the city of chicago and and scattering them out what we were doing or what the city was doing let me not take responsibility for the city's decision was disrupting generations of people who grew up in this community and it, it's very similar to what you're talking about like this is just where people lived it's what they knew it's their corner store it's everything that was who they are and who, who their grandparents were and then to have someone come in and be like mm, nope you need to go live over here yeah. now and especially if there hasn't been a trust established. There's definitely a Venn diagram uh, of inner cities and rural Appalachian folks that is, it's almost identical. You know, you would never convince yeah. these two groups that they were as similar as they are, but they really are. Yeah. Interesting. For us, outsiders are not people that we trust because outsiders yeah. have never done anything positive. Yeah. When the outsiders come in, you lose something. It does not matter. It's a hundred percent of the time. It's a thousand batting average. Yeah. It breeds a, a huge and horrible mistrust of people who may be the most well-intentioned people in the world may have great ideas, but don't come in here telling us how to run our railroad because you don't know anything about us. There's a tendency to be, Oh, well, the poor pitiful hill folk, you know, we need to go save them from the, themselves. And like, that really flies all over people here because we have sustained ourselves without outside help for hundreds of years. We don't need you. Right. You don't need capitalist colonization no. <laughs> of your hill folk. No. I mean, 
plenty of us still gladly work on the barter system. You know, if I've got something that you need and you've got something that I need and we've got a chore needs done, we work it out. Well, and, and to get to art too, I mean, I'm thinking of all the old, you know, original old, old timey music, folk music, you know, Woody Guthrie, all that stuff coming out of that area. It's so rich in culture. And, and I've seen what you've done in your artwork. It definitely, um, it's, it smacks of political commentary. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> I wouldn't have guessed that based on our conversation <laughs> so far. <laughs> I would have thought it was like bunny rabbits and kittens right. playing badminton. Do I come across that intense? I guess I do. <laughs> <laughs> but, you, know, you were talking about the musical culture that's so significant here you know and it's and it goes back to the same thing i was talking about of how unassuming most people around here are you know you are if you all are familiar with bill monroe the grand oh, yeah. of bluegrass that's right well pappy skidmore who lives over on cane creek he played banjo with him when they were starting out he was actually supposed to be bill monroe's road banjo player wow he ends up getting uh finding out he's going to have a son. So he has to give that dream up and stick around here. Yeah. I mean, and his, his son is a friend of mine and I, he works for the water department mm. here in town. We see each other all the time. And interesting. Tony Rice, the guitar player who just passed away. Oh, incredible. Some of his guitar riffs and, and yeah, well, Pappy and Tony go way back. I mean, when he died, it wasn't like, Oh, I liked his music. It was a friend of the family. So now this is all interwoven within this region mm. to such a point that no one even bats an eye at. Yeah, right. You know, we've got a local music store that just sells, you know, bluegrass instruments and parts for various instruments. Alice uh-huh. House is a regular customer. She comes down just to stop there. And the guy who works there won a Grammy. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so wait, let, let me let me clarify something for some of us city folk. Okay. Appalachia. I've heard of this place. I know there is a place called the Appalachian Mountain, but when you say that... I don't call it that, though, when you're here. We're Appalachia. Appalachia. Good. Okay. Okay. (laughs) I'm getting there. Yes. What is that region? Where is that region? It's Well, it's honestly, it's about 25 million people. Whoa. Okay. Run from New York down into Alabama. Okay. What's more traditionally thought of as the, the core Appalachian region, eastern Kentucky, southern West Virginia very southern Ohio, and then down into North Carolina and parts of Tennessee. Okay. The, the more southern part of it is what's more typically associated with Appalachia. Okay. Yeah. All right. I want to define it for the people. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and make sure we say it properly when we visit and yeah. get lost in the woods and then buy sticks. <laughs> right. When I've driven through there, and I, I, I love it just in Chicago, and Catherine, you've been in Chicago, it is mercilessly flat. So I love driving mm-hmm. and being in the hills oh. and, and the mountains. And, and mm-hmm. then, like I, I was telling Corey earlier, I bought a piece from, I was in a, in a gallery. It wasn't even a gallery. It was a, it was a gallery plus a bunch of other things that they sold at this place. And the guy brought out this thing. He said, yeah, this is something that one of the guys up in the hills make. It was probably made out of maybe a railroad tie. It was, it's very cool. It stands in my backyard now. And and there are those individuals that just live up in those small places. And it's the idea of getting it to where somebody would sell it or, is a task. Right. It is. The sense that I'm getting just from hearing you talk, Corey, is that like the art that comes out of Appalachia, it's just the culture. It's just what it is. It's not necessarily people trying to make big money things. It's like, this is what I make. This is what I do. This is my statement about where I live and who I am and who my people are. Is that accurate or am I overgeneralizing? Well, you know, and I hate to generalize it myself. You know, I, yeah. everyone has a different agenda. And of yeah. course, there are people who want to make it big, you know, and there are folks who make sticks to sell on the side of the road. But the, the one thing that I would definitely say that comes out of it is a, an incredible sincerity mm. because you, whether you're trying to make it or whether you're trying to just make some extra money, everyone here knows how unbelievably difficult it is to do anything here. Yeah. And so if, if you're trying to break into the art market and you're coming from a place like this, you know that the task ahead of you is, is a hundred times more difficult than it is for someone who lives in Soho or someone who lives in South Beach. I mean, mm-hmm, it's a mm-hmm. it's a completely different beast. There's no place for the timid. You know, you have to be really passionate about what you're doing, or it's okay. it's just never yeah. going to happen. And I think that the, the authenticity is very very important for people to understand about this region. There's been a whole bunch of people out there trying to replicate it, or, and they 
fake it. <laughs> right. Truth be told, I'm I'm I I love bluegrass and Americana, and I I I what you're talking about in, in music, Catherine. I may have said this before. It's three chords and the truth, baby. <laughs> <laughs> and I was listening to something today. I put on some Spotify thing, and a couple songs came up, and you could just hear that they were pulling out references, and they just sounded so fake. Well, I'll just tell you, I, I'll be that guy. I despise Tyler Childers. <laughs> There's a running mm-hmm. joke people that I know of like, oh, you know, Tyler Childers, he was actually born in a coal mine and cut from the wall of the mine itself. Like his grandfather was a, you know, a, a creek. You know, it's just, <laughs> it, it just gets so fake. Yeah. So now we're going to jump into Corey's art. And I have to say that I love the completely happenstance manner in which he discovered his talent. And I referenced the work of author Ellen Disanaki. And I feel horrible that I completely blanked on her name when I was talking with Corey. But her thinking on why we create art has stuck with me for some time now. I'll add links to her work in the episode description, so check her out. Check out, too, how having a kid helped push Corey into the creative. How did you come to this, okay, I'm going to make art? What, what, how did that come about? Uh, it's such a hillbilly story. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> I was engaged to a girl. Uh, we were no longer engaged, but I was at the time. And she had this rooster <laughs> that she adored. His name was Roy. Okay. Great, great. And Roy, unfortunately, was struck by a car, which happens to quite a lot of poultry when they build the road through the farm. So Roy was, he, he, he was taken from us far too soon. And it really, you know, I make light of it now, but it really was sad. I mean, it was like, okay. a pet, you mm-hmm. know, you know, she was just really wanting to commemorate this rooster. And I, for the life of me, could not think of any way to do that, but I wanted to be there for her and I wanted to be supportive. So I got a picture and I was like, I'm going to try to draw it. Like, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm just going to fumble through this and figure it out. And after a lot of trial and error, I actually had this rooster. I, it looked like Roy. And so I gave it to her. She was just moved to tears. It was a magical moment. And I just kind of kept fiddling around after that. More roosters, obviously. I thought I had a niche there, but Love there's it. not a big market. So I just kind of moved on in other direction. <laughs> I love that. you. Earlier when we were talking, it was reminding me of there's this author and she wrote a couple books, What is Art For?, and Homo Staticus, and talks about well, why, as a species, do we need art? Mm-hmm. How does it help us survive? So one of the things that she put out there is that art makes things important. Going back in history, we use art like around stressful times, right. right? Around a wedding, around the birth of a child. We make gravestones and, and monuments. We carve beautiful, intricate designs into armor mm-hmm. because it's important to us. And what you said is just that. This rooster was important. You memorialized it as right. important. Yeah. And I mean, in a way, it's pretty silly. But in another way, it's not. You know, no. I, that rooster yeah. meant something. Not to me necessarily, but I'm not one to judge. And you found you had a knack. And then I found that I had a, uh, an undiscovered talent for painting roosters. You know, what's really funny about it is um, Nellie Meadows... Uh, she was an artist from Clay City, which is about 10 minutes up the road. She did the annual Christmas card for the American Kidney Foundation every year. She was a fairly big deal. And um, there was a, one of her uh, pictures of a bird hung in the uh, White House when the Clintons were in there. But she had done a rooster that ended up being the official rooster and still is this day of the Kentucky Democratic Party. I've just, I've been really tickled by the fact that our little county is just rocking it when uh-huh. it comes to rooster art. <laughs> it really is. I, you know what? I, I feel like this is the thing. Like I need to now go <laughs> indulge and follow on Instagram, <laughs> hashtag rooster art. <laughs> Maybe the beginning of something. So what, what were you doing before you discovered this knack for drawing new roosters and beyond? And did you, curse that skill it's like damn now i gotta follow this <laughs> um, you know i in my day job i'm the director of a 911 dispatch center so uh, okay. okay i've been doing that for 20 years wow. it's much longer than anyone should have to do that job <laughs> uh, just, yeah but 
Yeah, it's hard. You know, I, I, I was always just sort of, I always had a passion for art. I love art. Museums, galleries, whatever. I just never actually thought I was any good. Like, I was like, oh, you know, I don't but I love to look at it and experience it. Mm. So, I mean, mm. I really just sort of live pretty methodically. Go to work, do your thing, come home, go back to work. Never really struck me mm-hmm. as something that I could do or should be doing. You know, right around the same time that uh, the rooster was born, um, a, a little bit before that, my son was born. And I, of course, being the dad, invested in the a good camera because I need to capture every single moment of his entire life. Of course. And, right. And I had kind of noticed that I had a little bit of, I wouldn't say, you know, that I'm great, but I had a bit of a knack for photography, for framing shots and things like that. And so I just sort of rolled with mm-hmm. it. And then uh, the two things have sort of merged, you know, I'm doing a lot now with photography and uh, photo manipulation and of course, you know, standard art, painting, drawing, all that. But Prior to getting a decent camera or painting a rooster, I had no idea that I had any ability to do anything. Like, I, I was just going to be the cog in the wheel, you know, and I've always been an activist. I've always, you know, hollered yeah. a lot about, you know, hillbilly stuff. Did my fair share of protesting in the streets during the Bush administration, you know, all that kind of stuff. So my life before that was pretty unfulfilling, you know, before, <laughs> before I became a dad. Wow. How old were you then? I, well, I'm 41 now. Uh, Charlie, my son, is uh, he'll turn eight in January. Okay. So, um, yeah, I was probably in my early 30s. So you were, I'm just a cog in the wheel. Like, that. that's just what life's going to be. This is it. This is. Right. And then how would you describe your life now, now that you're an, an artist? I'm still very much a cog in the wheel. A cog in the wheel of the art world? Well, I mean. I would say that my life right now, for one, is definitely more cluttered, <laughs> paper and, uh-huh, uh-huh. and pens and all that stuff. But no, it's just, it's different. You know, there's a there's an immense sense of pride associated with it that's not even so much with the work, which I'm very passionate about, but, but with trying my best to be an example for people here in my home, um, you know, to uplift yeah. people. We get beaten down constantly. And to uplift people and say, listen, you know, I know you're from Boonville or Bateville. I know you're from these places that are literally the poorest places in the United States of America. Uh, A kind of poverty you don't see other places. But you can be something Mm -hmm. if you just grab it, you know, and you just work it. You can get there. And your your voice matters every bit as much as anyone else's. Yeah. I think that's the fulfilling thing that's really happened since I got into this is just trying to be an advocate for millions of people who don't, I mean, honestly, I'm not trying to inflate myself. I'm just one person, but mm-hmm. there aren't advocates for us. There just aren't. Yeah. When you deliver that message, what type of response do you get? Locally is very positive. Uh, everything I do, they put in the newspaper here, paper, and that's, you know, that's great. There's an overwhelmingly positive familial vibe within this community. Mm-hmm. We're so insulated. We count on each other. You know, if you get snowed in, sometimes the salt truck can't make it there and you and your neighbors have to cut yourselves out. You know, that's just life here. Now outside of here, it can be a little tricky. People definitely have an expectation of me and what I'm going to be based on my background. Often that's, it's a surprise when I'm not like, I don't know what people think I'm going to show up and, you know, overalls with no shirt on. And uh, (laughs) we save that for Saturday. We don't do that when we go to town. (laughs) (laughs) You've been on outsider art magazine, art portfolio magazine, art quench magazine, probably a few others. That's certainly reaching outside of your area. And like, like you said, there's sort of this expectation or this thought that, they're going to bring you in and you're going to look some, some type of way. Right. Um, almost as if they want you to look they, that way. Oh, they do. I promise they do. Sure. It's not everyone, but there is a definite contingency out there of people. Who, they want me to come in, in, uh, you know, a plaid shirt, half tucked in and dirty jeans and a, some sort of cowboy hat, like some sort of weird, 
uh, amalgamation of what they think people around here look like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I've yeah, literally yeah. never seen a human being who actually looks like that around here. <laughs> yep. So you're, what you're telling us, Corey, is um, you're a human being and not a stereotype? I know it's shocking, but it's actually true. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what to say. <laughs> I have running water. I have electricity. Like, nothing is more enraging than right now the popularity of Hillbilly Elegy. Yeah. So, you know, New York Times bestseller, Ron Howard's made it into a film, and it's garbage. I, I've never spoken to one person who gets anything but angry at the mention of it. It's, it's a fabrication. It's a guy from, he's from Middletown, Ohio, you know, and he periodically mm. visited here. And then he writes this memoir about life growing up in, in Appalachia. And it's like, dude, you never even lived here. Mm. It's, it's, it's poverty porn. Now, I will say, though, in the movie, the one thing everybody does agree on is Glenn Close nailed looking like everybody's memo. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but the rest of it is, it's just trash. And our representation so often is that. It's trash. Mm. And the pity and the sympathy. I, know, I feel like I've just gotten completely off on a tangent here. Like, I know we're supposed to be talking about art. No, that's okay. Because how much does that then inspire your art? Tremendous. Tremendously. Yeah. I don't feel like I am allowed to do anything than what's my absolute best because i think look if you're given a platform no matter how big or small it is and you're given that opportunity to speak on behalf of people you care about you can't screw that up you have to make sure that what you're putting out there is something meaningful so you're doing whatever you can to not be thrown into that even though you feel the forces of people trying to pull you into it and you're also taking on some responsibility for making sure you represent your your community in an accurate light and in a way that pays it the respect that it's owed right yeah i i feel a huge responsibility for that and i think you know yeah. anyone that i know who came from here or still is here we all feel that burden of whenever you are somewhere else you know break out the church manners because you want to do your best to represent us. You're not, you know, most people, you know, you guys don't run into a lot of people from Appalachia. Most of us are still here. Mm -hmm. So you know, when you run into somebody and they say they're from not County, Kentucky, that's as rural as it gets. You will probably never meet another person from there. Yeah. So it's, you know, we're kind of indoctrinated of like, you've got to, you got to act right. You're now a whole region of people. Mm -hmm to people who've never, who have never met wow. and will never meet another one. It's a lot of responsibility or a lot of pressure. It's very tiring. <laughs> I love the passion and total adoration that Corey has for his community and the people he feels some sense of responsibility to. And I believe they're in good hands as Corey seems nowhere near selling them short. Catherine's going to mention a previous guest, Louis Sagoon, and we're going to hear more about the striking comparisons between Appalachian populations and other marginalized cultures, as well as the continued good work that Corey is looking to do in that arena. Rest assured, he has Catherine's vote for any and all his efforts, and I'd be there casting the same vote. I think if Luis, who is a Latinx artist, he really identified with materials and how they represented him. And But again, this piece of like speaking out for himself, for his community. You know, you said earlier, Corey, that so many parallels between Appalachian people and inner city people. So I, I, I really hear it in everything that you're saying and like the culture not being recognized as unique and authentic. You know, from experiences I've had talking with people who have worked in those uh, type of communities, especially like right now with COVID-19 going on, being involved in emergency services, you know, we're in contact with much larger agencies, yeah. more in Louisville and Lexington. You know, they've expressed to me is that messaging is so hard in some of these communities, whether it's mm. immigrant communities or communities that are primarily made up of people of color or LGBTQ communities, where maybe being an outside voice isn't effective. And yeah. it's the exact same problem we deal with here. So we've, I've actually been working with uh, Dr. Diane Francis at the University of Kentucky about better messaging within insulated communities mm -hmm. to try and reach people. Uh, you know, again, we have our differences, but we're almost a clone of each wow. other in, in, in the way yeah. that we operate. Very interesting. 
I know we're talking to you about art, but I, I like, I'm like, art, this guy is just a fucking advocate. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, like po- politician was the first word that came to mind, but I'm like, no, because that, that it's, you're like what I think a politician should be. Well, I appreciate that. Who really cares about the people of their community and wants to fight for them and wants to make sure the people in the community are seen and heard and recognized. That is what is like screaming off my screen. Every time you open your mouth, I'm like, yeah, I'm like if I lived there, I would vote for you. I live out here and I'm going to vote for you as like whoever you need to be to keep doing this because I, I think voice is really important. And whether it's your speaking voice or your activist voice or your artist voice, which clearly you have all three of those and I'm sure many more, like I I hear the passion and I hear the community connection and everything you've been saying. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, that, There's really nothing you could have said that was more complimentary than that. So I really appreciate it. (laughs) My work is done. That's really what I feel from you, Corey, like very, very strongly. I love this place. And you know, I've batted around the idea of leaving, moving to larger place to, you know, where I could still advocate for people, but, you know, have a, a, a better opportunity, maybe at a larger platform. And the reality of it is, is I just don't, I don't want to, mm-hmm. Yeah. you know, it's, it's much harder to do it from here, but I want to be here. I, I'm not, you know, and that's another concept like that people are stuck in Appalachia. There's no way out. Yes, we have paved roads, and anybody can drive out <laughs> right, right. and never come back. It's not impossible. I know it's shocking. I actually like it here. Up next, Corey talks about his process, working outside of a box, creating art that makes him laugh, and how sometimes that's enough. Catherine also learns about Google, and we all learn why folks in Appalachia are multi-talented. I'd I'd love to explore too about your process. So you moved from roosters to to photography. How has your process evolved? And and is that driven by some of these emotions that you're feeling about your community and what's happening around you? Or is it another force that is working within you? Well, you know, I would say that probably the biggest advantage that I have going is... um, I have no idea what I'm doing and I have no concept of my own limitations. Yes. No box. (laughs) (laughs) If, um, if something strikes me, like then I just do it. And if it falls completely apart, okay, didn't work. Move on to the next thing. You know, typically it starts digitally. The iPad has been Mm -hmm. an absolute blessing and that's usually where everything starts. And then I don't always know which way it's going to go may end up being a fully formed digital piece. It may evolve into something more three-dimensional or something that I'm going to uh, turn into a, you know, a painting on canvas. Uh, But I think that's part of what makes me love this because I have no idea what something's going to be when I start it. So do you take the, the beginnings of an idea and sit down or do you sit down and wait for the beginnings of an idea? No, I can't wait for it. Uh, I, I, I can't. I, I'm not one of those people who can say, well, all right, it's 8 a.m. And from 8 to 9, I'm going to work on, mm-hmm. you know, art. I can't do that. Yeah. I, if I'm not inspired by something specific that I need or want to do, I can't do anything. Yeah. I, then I just get mad. Yeah. Um, yeah. But like I had a, a friend of mine, he is a news uh, reporter for Channel 27 out of Lexington. And he, there was this picture somebody had candidly caught of him and he was running because he'd forgotten his keys. And he's running back to get his keys, but it looked like this great action shot. And so I ended up taking that and I turned it into this ridiculous, like GI Joe box art uh-huh. with uh, the, it was KY Joe. And then, you know, Victor, Victor Pointe and action. Sequence. I've seen them. Okay. Yeah. They, and they, they look like the GI Joe. I was, I was looking at it and, yeah, go ahead. I'm, it was cool. But then it turned into, I did one with Henry Clay and one with Colonel Sanders. And I really like <laughs> want to go back and do a whole series of these because I think they're hilarious. Um, but I've sold a couple of those to people who are just big fans of Henry Clay and Colonel Sanders. <laughs> so, uh, what I hear in your, your process, Corey, is that you make art for you. It's like, I think this is funny, so I'm going to make it. Yeah, I don't care. I, I don't care. If I, if I never sold another thing, I would still make ridiculous Kentucky G.I. Joe figures because they're just fun. Yes. You know, and, <laughs> and if you get a laugh out of your neighbor with it, then 
wonderful because that that's currency yeah. too. You know, yeah. making yeah. somebody feel yeah, better, yeah. and that's yeah. worth something. It's like, I love the one with is it the copper tone baby on like a, on a dump? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's modeled after. Uh, I'm trying to think of that. I don't know if it was New Delhi or Mumbai, but either way, it was a, a particularly bad uh, run that they had there of beach pollution. And I thought, well, you know, that's let's just address some realism here. Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. The copper tone era has, has ended. We are now covered in trash. Like I had mentioned earlier, you have been featured on some of these, these, these magazines, these publications. Yeah. How did you first get there? Did they contact you? Did you reach out and say, hey, let me show you my oh, work? Oh, yeah. I totally bored myself out. Like, you know, I had a couple of pieces that I thought were maybe not great, but good enough that I felt like okay. I could share. Mm -hmm. And I just started, uh, you know, going through calls for entry and saying, okay, well, that maybe kind of fits what I did. And so I would submit that and get rejected. And then I would submit again and get rejected. And I mean, just, you know, relentlessness, like I said, no concept of my own limitations. I just kept going until somebody said yes. Do you, like, how did you know to go for calls for entry? You were like, I want to get my art out into the world. Yeah. And then basically just typed into Google, how do I get my art out into the world? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'm just sitting over here feeling like a giant moron for a moment. Like, I'm like, how did he do that? I, I wonder how I could do that. Google. <laughs> Never crossed my mind. I, I will be Googling later. How do I get my art into the world? Right. <laughs> we are very resourceful people. We. <laughs> it works, though. Pretty late in your life, relatively speaking. You do this rooster. You, do, you pick up the camera. Was there anybody that looked at you cockeyed when you decided that you really wanted to make this be a part of your life? I think my mother was completely stunned because she had no idea. But she said, you know, she said, when I was a kid, I drew my stick figures and I, they always had knees. I always drew knees. <laughs> and she said, I should have known with the knees that you had a knack. <laughs> but uh, no, honestly, no one even looked askance at me. It was just like, okay, we're doing this now. All right. What can I do to help? Let's all get on board. That's so cool. You know, you need models. We'll, you know, you tell me I'm here, you know. I can feel the sense of the community. Yeah. Well, you know, it's part of, part and parcel with the fact that here, every, no one is one thing. Yeah. yeah. You know, I'm the 911 director, but I'm also the public relations manager for our county. I'm also uh, the GIS agent for, you know, mapping projects. I'm also whatever else they need me to be at the moment. And when you're in poor communities like ours, without a tax base and without revenue, nobody has the luxury of being one thing. Yeah. Like mm. our, our produce stands have tanning beds and pizza places in them. You know, it's, yeah. you have to be able to do a lot to survive. So what I really appreciate about this is the adaptability. You are more complex human being than just what your job is. You're everything. You're whatever you need to be in the moment. I think that gives you so much more freedom. I almost can feel that in how you described your process. That there, there. I was like, yes, there's no box. He doesn't like a box to be in. You're like, no, I want to just whatever happens, happens. And that that seems to parallel like your community and how you survive in it. Yeah, my existence has pretty much always been to fly by the seat of my pants because yeah. that's what you mm -hmm. have to do. Yeah. And that's definitely translated into my creative process is that, you know, if I sat down and came up with an idea and, and storyboard, you know, how I want to do this, I would just end up getting really bored with it and never right. finish it. So, you know, I'll, I'll jump into something and fool with it until you're sick of it. And I just throw it out until I want to come back to it. Yeah. If I never come back to it, I never do. Right. Yeah. But it's the unpredictability of it that makes it fun. And if, when it stops being fun, I have to stop yeah. doing it. Yeah. Have you inspired anybody to pick up a pencil and draw a snake or whatever the next animal might be? <laughs> I hope I'm the inspiration for it. My son absolutely loves this. Like he has so much fun. If there's an extra canvas, he's all over it. But yeah, actually, you know, I've talked to some people who have kind of started their own kind of journey, you know, whether it's with a camera or a, an mm -hmm. iPad or just in paper or whatever, who said, you know, I'm not, I, I don't think that I'm very good. And I'm like, that's cool. I don't think I'm very good either, but you know, somebody else does and that's all that matters. Mm -hmm. So if you, you know, if you make it and you like it and somebody else likes it, then you're an artist. Yeah. Like that's all there is to it. This isn't rocket right, science. Right. Well, and that's, I've heard that said about artwork. It's like, when, well, when do you determine that it's art? And the first person that has to is the artist, the creator. Mm -hmm. And then they take it to somebody and maybe it's a friend who says, wow, that's really cool. I like that. 
right? And at that time, it might have been your fiance that really liked the picture of your your rooster. The rooster. And then enough people are saying they like this. Then maybe you get a you know a store in town or a gallery to say, yeah, this is art, and they're going to hang it on their wall. Um, and then it is kind of fed by other people looking at it and, and, and saying they like it. Right. And, you know, I'm as, I'm as, I have the same insecurities and hangups as mm-hmm. anybody else. You know, it just blows my mind. You're like, I'm going to work six months on something. And then be like, I just, that sucks. And then I, you know, in two hours, I produce something that I think like, ah, that, I really like that. And, you know, that's the, but that's the fun part. Yes. Now we're going to discuss what helped Corey become the creative person that he would eventually become. It could be his lack of resources early on, his being an only child, or as Catherine opines, his kneecaps, which may require an insurance policy relatively soon. Certainly your son's relationship with creativity and art is enhanced by you discovering art and and that whole world of creativity. Can you look back to when you were that age and think maybe it was the knees on the stick men, or maybe it was something else, or is there something that you're like, man, if I would have gotten this earlier, maybe this all would have started sooner, or have you not even given it that much thought? Well, no, I mean, I definitely think that there's something to that. You know, when I, when I was a kid, my creativity was really enhanced by the fact that I was an only child to mm. a single mom. Mm. We lived with my grandmother and my aunt. My grandmother lived on a miner's pension. My mother worked in a factory. My uh, aunt was going to college. She became a teacher. We didn't have a lot. We were poor. Uh, you know, the combined resources of three people can go quite a ways. You know, that did mean that going to art shows and the theater or things like that were... I mean, come on, that's not happening. And being an only child, you know, I really had to kind of invent my own fun. I got to be really good at it. There's this thing, though, Corey, like your mom is like, ah, the kneecaps on the stick figures. That's what it was. Um, I'm sure with that accent, too. But what... (laughs) <laughs> of course i don't even know what that accent Jordan was but it's clearly right, right there in <laughs> <laughs> it's my very fancy accent um but so when i hear what got you going it was like memorializing this rooster it was well my son's born so I, you know I, I gotta gotta take pictures like any any person might think to do with their kids but like there's something about the I'm I'm with your mom on those kneecaps because <laughs> you took it that step further my my right. parents I look at pictures of like they took when we were me and my siblings were kids they had the eye but neither one of them did anything with it you right. you saw that in yourself through the images you were taking and then you you kept going with it and I credit that to your kneecaps <laughs> I think so I'll be sure I mentioned to her that that we have gotten to the bottom of this and she's right it was That's the so kneecaps cool. that is actually where your inspiration lives in the kneecaps <laughs> I feel like now I really need to do something with that. Like I need a very elaborate kneecap centric piece. I would like for you to be wary of Tanya Harding. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, I met her. I actually oh, you met did. her. I met her at a bar in Winchester about 20 minutes Love from it. here. She was uh, married to some poor bastard or, or engaged to him that lived there in Clark County. They were in visiting their family and I walk outside and I'm like, no possible way. I'm in the middle of nowhere. I swear to God, that's Tanya Hardy. So I, I walked over to him like, I, I realize this is totally crazy, but is there any way that you're Tanya Hardy? And she said, no. Are you sure? And she, she said, okay, yes, actually I am. And I was like, oh my God. I said, so did you do it? <laughs> yes, 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 yes. That is the only thing to ask her. Yeah, and I, you know, with with all due respect to her, I won't say uh, on air what she answered, but I will say that she did give me an answer. Uh, respect to her. I mean, uh, th- th- she had a lot to overcome. She yeah. did. She grew up very difficult. Mm-hmm. Plus, I don't want to piss her off. I don't want- <laughs> Your kneecaps Whoa. are... She's nearby. She could be outside <laughs> right now. <laughs> Steve, we might need to redact to this part of the yeah. interview. <laughs> yeah, <I think> so. <laughs> the bloop. <laughs> yeah. 
this has been so much fun. I, I, Absolutely. I have loved listening to your inspiration, but the advocacy and just how much you embrace where you're from and how you want to make sure that you represent it in a way that, that it deserves. I think that's so cool. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you a lot. And I mean, I, I've had a blast too. This is, this is so much fun. I was nervous when I came on here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, now it's just like I forgot where you, I'm dead serious. I forgot we have been doing a thing. Like, oh, I'm just like, oh, I'm just talking to my friends. Yes, yeah. people, people <laughs> always say that, that they're so nervous to come on. I'm like, nervous, honey. Oh, I yeah. just finished like a nine hour day. We're just gonna sit here and shoot this shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <I think so. laughs> Again, it was so much fun talking to, you, and we'll do what we can to to get your name out there and get people to see your artwork and get them to understand more about, about you know, Appalachia. I, did I say it right? Appalachia. Appalachia. Well, thank you guys for the opportunity. I mean, it, you know, it, it means a lot to us. Love it. And say hi to your son. It, it was great to see his little hand pop in with a wave. So anyway. <laughs> the little hand. <laughs> <laughs> Are you, you want to say hi? Uh, hi. Would you like to come in here and say hi? Oh, sorry. He's playing Cuphead. There's no hope. <laughs> Have fun. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. You take care. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. So there you have it. Another way cool and totally enjoyable discussion with a unique, talented, thoughtful, and fun artist. I have nothing but total respect for Corey. He's so committed to being that positive voice and advocate for his community which is an underrepresented group of people that many know almost nothing about, aside from the characterized stereotypes that are popular in today's media. As a result, those in Appalachia get the shaft way too often, and it's great that Corey is stepping up to represent. Please check out Corey's work at www.corey-gram.com. And also remember that our website is www.kitesandstrings.com. Talk about us with your friends and please rate us wherever you podcast because it really helps. And also drop an idea, comment, or whatever via email at kitesandstringspodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram and newly Twitter and YouTube. We'll put the links in our episode description. The Kites and Strings theme music is by Harrison Amir. Other original music is by Purple Planet Music at purpleplanet.com. Today's episode was produced and edited by me, Steve Plume, at Turning Stones Counseling, Inc. Be safe.